Are you sure you're up to it? You seem a little slow. This is the dark tale of the soon-to-be-immortal lich Celadane in Oblivion, and exploring who ordered the contract on his life. After performing the purification on the members of the Chaden Hall Sanctuary, we return to the listener, Lucien Lachance, in his private hideout in Fort Farragut for our reward and next contract. Although our resolve has been bolstered by the Dreadfather Sithis during the ritualistic slaughter, as with all kills in his name, as we leave the grisly scene, we can't help but feel uneasy at the fact we just murdered our former adoptive family in an effort to snuff out a supposed traitor in their midst. A traitor who, as we were so focused on our task, we never found any concrete evidence of. Burying the thought, we enter Farragut and Lachance senses our unease. When approaching the speaker, he assuages. The ritual of purification is complete. Well done. Sithis has been appeased, and the time has come to acknowledge and reward your unwavering loyalty. The Black Hand is most pleased with your progress. You have been invited to share in secrets that few within the Dark Brotherhood even know exist. Your life in the Sanctuary is over. Those contracts are behind you. Now... You will serve the Black Hand. You will serve me. From this moment forward, you will walk in the shadows as my silencer. You will receive contracts only from me. Your new life has begun. We then have three options to respond. First, as always, is to say nothing. Listen well, child. Or the confused. But... <sighs> What must I do now? It is quite simple, really. And finally, feeling the love of our dread father once more. All hail, Sithis. All hail the void. Hail, Sithis, indeed, my child. Now listen closely. No longer will you receive your orders directly. Instead, you will visit secret dead drops. Your next contract can be found at the Dead Drop on Hero Hill, southeast of here. A hollow in the moss-covered rock contains all you need to know. When you leave here, we will not speak again unless I deem it necessary. Ah, yes, there is one last thing. I have for you a very special gift. Waiting just outside is a magnificent steed named Shadowmere. She has served me well. I present her now to you as a token of my trust and love. Now go, and may Sithis guide you in this new stage of your life's dark journey. Before leaving, we ask... What is your role as silencer, brother? The Black Hand is the Dark Brotherhood's ruling council. That hand consists of four speakers and one listener. Four fingers and a thumb, as it were. This you already know. What is not commonly known among our family members is that the Black Hand employs a few <laughs> additional numbers. As every hand has fingers, does not every finger have a nail, a claw, a talon? Every finger of the hand, every speaker has such a nail. These are the silences. Each speaker employs his or her own private assassin to extend their reach and strike forth as necessary. My previous silencer perished while fulfilling a contract. That emptiness has now been filled by you. It is an honor without equal. Go now, child of Sithis. Walk in the shadow of fear and bring glory to our dread father. Approaching Lucian once more, he simply guides. What is it, silencer? You have your orders, Silencer. 
ask of me what you will, and then make haste to Hero Hill. Your first dead drop contract awaits. Exiting the refuge via rope ladder to take on our next contract, we emerge from the hollowed out tree and make our way southeast towards our promised reward for the purification. Lucian's personal steed, the horse known as Shadowmere, as one of the fastest horses in the game, this shadowy black mare is also essential and cannot be killed, only knocked unconscious. In such event, she will wander back to Fort Farragut when coming around, if not mounted. Making our way to the promised dead drop, our quest updates reading. According to Lucien the Chance, I will now receive my contracts as well as any rewards I may be owed by visiting secret dead drop locations scattered around Cyrodiil. My next contract can be found in a hidden hollow inside the moss-covered rock on the top of Hero Hill, which is to the southeast of Fort Farragut. Arriving at the valley marked by sparse steps, we indeed see a large rock jutting out on a small hill and exploring the mound with our hands, we find an opening that appears quite hollow. Inside, as promised, we locate our dead drop orders. We then begin our long journey, traveling far east of Breville and heading south on the eastern side of the Nibane Valley towards the Panther River. Reading our orders in full, in an approximation of the silence's voice in our head, Lucian writes, Silence, sir. You are now reading your first dead drop note here on Hero Hill, which proves to me you are well appointed to the tasks that lie ahead. Journey now to Leafrot Cave. There you will encounter an ancient necromancer who is attempting to escape death by transforming himself into a lich. This necromancer, Celadane, has not yet completed his metamorphosis, but is still immensely powerful. Possibly too powerful to destroy if confronted directly. Search Leafrot Cave. Necromancers are wizards after all, and wizards are prolific by nature. Celadane surely has written records, and these records may contain evidence of some kind of weakness. Perhaps there is some other way to destroy Celadane besides a direct confrontation. But destroy him you must. When the necromancer lies dead, journey to the city of Coral for your next dead drop. At the foot of the Great Oak, hidden in the bushes, is an old sack. Inside, you will find your reward for killing the necromancer, as well as information regarding your next contract. Serve me well, Silencer, and there's no telling just how far you might advance. Entering the musty cave, we hear shuffling in the cavern's depths, and an undead servant rushes forth to meet our trespassing. <laughs> Heading north into the cave's bowels. We find ourselves in a makeshift living quarters, but scarcely have time to survey our surroundings as a dread zombie and its minions spill forth to end our unwanted interloping. We proceed to pepper the ghoul with arrows as it ambles towards us in a malaise, falling only to pick itself back up and continuing to stalk us down over and over. Its fervor in service of its unseen master is almost commendable, and we wonder where he obtained all these bodies for his ever-growing army of the undead. With a final bolt to the torso, we end the wretched creature's life. It's then we take a moment to take in our surroundings proper. To the west of the room, we see an alchemical station covered in cobwebs, books including the skill-boosting art of war and magic, skulls, and clothing items are also haphazardly strewn about. Evidently, this wizard has little need for earthly possessions, and as we see on the eastern side of the room, a small grubby bedroll affixed to some stakes and a much-needed hourglass, presumably to keep time in the dank gloom. Hastening our search as the wizard will surely return to his camp at some time, we see perhaps we may be too late to stop him. 
as on the northeastern table, we have confirmation of his attempts to transcend his fleshy shackles and become a lich with his journey titled The Path to Transcendence, which reads, Entry 1. My initial findings may have been inconclusive, but they've set me on the path I will pursue until I achieve my goal, or lie rotting in this cave. Either outcome will be a welcome respite from my days and nights I've spent toiling without food, water, or any kind of companionship. Unless a mage would have fallen prey to madness by now, I'm sure of it. But I am not a lesser mage. Though they try in earnest, though their hearts and minds are true to the teachings of our great sovereign, my fellow necromancers lack the complete dedication required to achieve the ultimate of goals, the state of lichdom. Not even Falkai himself can match my sheer tenacity, my unwillingness to accept failure on any level. That is why I, Saladane, will soon join the ranks of the Worm Emirates, those servants favoured by our Sovereign above all others, and will sit with honour and obedience at his right hand while those fools in the Mages Guild grovel at my maggot-ridden feet. Entry 2 even the most pedestrian peasant fairy tale has long held that a lich must somehow remain bound to his soul, and that connection most commonly manifests itself as a transference of the spirit into an actual physical object. An urn? A sarcophagus, a crystal file. One Khajiit fairy tale even tells of a lich who preserved his spirit in the severed head of a wood elf infant. And these same peasants long comforted themselves with the belief that if they ever had the grave misfortune of facing a lich, they would need only find the vessel containing his spirit form and destroy it, thus destroying the lich himself. Fools in their folklore, true liches possess no such weakness. Can one of the sovereign's worm eremites be bested by shattering a glass vase? The very notion is so absurd as to be comical. Yes, a necromancer must transfer his soul into a physical vessel, but once that transference is complete, once the necromancer has fully metamorphosed into his lich form, the vessel is inconsequential. But it's the process of this transference itself that has eluded me for so long. My soul remains bound to my earthly body, and nothing I have attempted has allowed me to free myself of this mortal coil and transcend to the state of lichdom I so dearly desire. Entry 3 Every term I've acquired, the volumes upon volumes of necromantic discourse, all useless. I've grown disgusted by the years of wasted life that have been poured into these so-called essential writings. Who in their right mind would ever wish to animate a month-dead cyrodelic butterfly, or bring to life the rotting husk of a rare albino mud crab? How many months have I wasted away in this cave? And for what reason? Ah, yes, I know. I will resurrect an army of deformed goblin younglings and march on the White Gold Tower itself. That at least is in my reach. My mind has become a cesspool of necromantic waste, where reject spells and rituals compete for the honor of finally driving me completely insane. And still, I'm no closer to achieving my goal than I was when I first began this process. Am I losing faith in myself, in my discipline? Perhaps I've been studying too hard. Many a night I've sacrificed my prayers to our Sovereign for one more experiment, one more incantation. What I need now is rest. Rest in a state of tranquility, that I may commune with our Sovereign and re-pledge my loyalty and devotion. For what answer will I find in some crumbling codex that could not be supplied by our great sovereign himself? Entry 4 The secret is mine! So long have I searched, so hard I toiled, but I was a fool! I was right to forgo my studies for more ardent devotion to prayer. Last night, as I sit in the throes of meditation, our great sovereign did come to me. He passed to me the knowledge I have sought for so long. 
The secrets of transcendence were even more complex and arcane than even I could have imagined, and I will never transcribe them into any written work. Indeed, they have never been recorded. All my months of solitude were for naught, as the secret I so desperately sought could only be obtained through direct communication with our great sovereign himself. Soon I will walk the earth as a worm eremite, serving the sovereign in a state of endless undeath. Entry 5. Through the sacrifice of many innocents, the resurrection of many servants to aid in my tasks, and the tireless performance of nearly week-long ritual, I have completed construction of the Sands of Resolve. The transcendence to full lichdom will not be immediate, however. The vessel has been crafted, but my energy force, my soul, must be fully transferred into it. Not even our sovereign was quite certain how long this process would take, as it varies from one necromancer to the next based on many factors, both physical and spiritual. One thing, however, is certain. This hourglass must never leave my possession until the transference is complete. I grow more powerful every day, but in truth I am more vulnerable than I've ever been. If something were to happen to the Sands of Resolve, if the hourglass should somehow leave my person, the connection between soul and vessel would be severed. To think that my work, my life, could be eradicated so easily after I've come so close to success, it's almost more than I can bear. Although we now know the method to end Saladin's transcendence, destroying the hourglass on his person, and perhaps who ordered his death, which we will explore shortly thereafter, first, this is where the quest takes two distinct paths. To either A, confront him without destroying the coveted trinket, as we were cautioned against, or B, to stealthily remove said hourglass from his person. Exploring Path 1 we move to the northeastern chamber and find the door ahead locked and hear the undead clawing at the other side. Instead, we choose to enter the northeastern door, which leads to Leaf Rot Hollow. Inside, we see the undead have torn each other apart, including a sizable rat, perhaps for the wizard's amusement. Deeper in the southern tunnel, we turn and see there was a cave blocking our path and a poor soul, blood smattering the ground under them, was no doubt crushed during the unfortunate event. Making our way into the southwestern cave, we find a single ghost and zombie patrolling a small nook. Contending with the undead, we light our torch to see the stacks of coffins mentioned in the necromancer's journal. Clearly, incensed at their rest being disturbed and their life taken, they've become supernatural guardians, doomed to haunt these caves with their ilk. Looping back down out of the area beset by corpses, we break our way into the northeastern door which leads down into Celadane's ritual chamber. The wizard then materializes near an altar of skulls and bones, apparently mid-ritual and immediately about faces to meet us in the dank tomb, turning invisible without a word and summoning his vassal to attack us. Ha! You'll never take me down! Disoriented in the catacombs, we attempt to fight off his underlings as they spawn in a steady stream, trying in vain to bridge the gap between us and the powerful wizard. It's only when we get arm's length from him does he char our body with a devastating fireball, casually stepping over our body as the life leaves our eyes. <laughs> Otherwise, to sneak up on the enraged wizard, we attempt to break into the northeastern door located in his living quarters. We then slip through the final door into a small chamber that appears, at first glance, to be a dead end, save for a peculiar hole in the ground covered by two planks. Attempting to get a better look below, we step through the plank and go crashing into the chamber beneath us. Landing somewhat safely on the rubble, we peer through the door ahead and see Celadane stalking about his ritual chambers to and fro. Knowing we have only one chance to evade the necromancer's wrath, we remember the scroll of invisibility gratefully plucked from the corpse of our former brother-in-arms, Mirage Dar. 
and quickly cast the spell so we blend further into the shadows beyond the wizard's keen eyesight. Stealthily creeping behind the necromancer, no doubt mid-ritual and close to ascending to his final lich form, we catch him in the northwestern chamber as he checks on a pile of bones and yank the sands of resolve off his person as he casts a final spell in vain and crumples to the floor. His final assault averted, a quest then updates reading, Celadain is dead. I must pick up my reward and next contract at the dead drop located in an old sack hidden in the bushes beneath the great oak in the city of Coral. Removing his necromancer attire, we take one last look at the powerful Altma before leaving his mortal corpse to rot among the dead of his fallen victims. Emerging from the cave, we cast our mind back to his letter and realize who most likely was responsible for the contract on his life. Back in Shadenhall, we had previously met a rather repugnant Altma, very similar to Celadane, named Falcar. You smell of death. Been conjuring up dead things? We later learned Falcar is not only a fellow necromancer and you. enemy of Celadane, but also in the employ of Manimarco. In a letter we find on Falcar before he betrays the Mages Guild in which he pretended to serve, he not only openly murdered a Mages Guild member, which means he's brazen enough to call the Black Sacrament, but also having Celadane raised as a lich above him when Manimarco returned would be a thorn in his side. And as he was stuck keeping up appearances running the Mages Guild chapter in Chadenhall, it would have been far easier for him to send an assassin to ferret out his competition, who gained Manny's favor, before Celadane could ascend to Lichhood. I expect this will end in disaster, but nonetheless, I will grant your request.